The big mistake. Ian James was really happy. The school year had finished, and the results of his exams were better than expected. Now, after all those weeks of hard work, he was going on holiday. Fortunately, his rich uncle, Uncle Patrick, hadn't forgotten his promise. Ian had spoken to him on the phone two nights before. Everything was planned. Uncle Patrick had left for France, so his house by the sea was empty. He'd left the fridge full of food and drink, and the key was under the doormat. Ian could use the house until his uncle returned. Paula, his girlfriend, was coming to stay with him the next day, and they would be able to spend some time together. He stared through the train window, watching the houses, fields, and people go by. The train began to slow down as it came into Bridgeview Station. The fat woman that sat opposite him was still asleep. The train stopped suddenly. Ooh! She exclaimed, standing up and putting her head out of the window. It's Bridgeview! She picked up her handbag and rushed to the door. It's lucky I woke up, otherwise, I would have gone on to Little Point. So Ian knew he had to get off the train at the next station. He looked at his watch as the train left the station. Almost six o'clock. He was hungry and started thinking about all the food in the fridge that was waiting for him. The scenery changed. In the distance, he could see the sea and a few people on the beach. Ian had never been to his uncle's house before. He hadn't realized that he lived so close to the sea. He hoped it wasn't too polluted. He could smell the salty air of the sea. The train hooted as it approached the station of Little Point. Ian grabbed his suitcase and got off the train. Luckily, there was a taxi free. He put his case in the boot and asked the driver to take him to Cliff View. What number? the driver asked. A 28, Ian replied. It didn't take long to get there. The taxi stopped outside the largest house in the street. Ian paid the taxi driver and picked up his case. As he walked up the path, he wondered who had planted all the flowers in the garden. He didn't think his uncle was the type to be interested in gardening. He continued up the path and stopped at the door. He lifted up the doormat. The key was exactly where his uncle Patrick had promised. He opened the door and entered the hall, closing the door behind him. He left his suitcase by the stairs, walked through the hallway and into the lounge. There were two long sofas in one corner of the room, and a table and chairs occupied the centre. The floor was covered by a thick brown carpet, and beige curtains hung at the windows. There was an enormous cabinet containing a lot of different ornaments and a vase of flowers on the table. Ian explored the rest of the ground floor. There was a bathroom, a dining room, a small study, and a large kitchen. Ian carried his suitcase upstairs. There were three bedrooms and a bathroom. He chose the biggest room and threw his case on the bed. He was too tired to unpack it. He went into the bathroom and had a quick shower. He left the towels on the floor and went to get dressed. He emptied his case, throwing his clothes on the chair. He would hang them up in the wardrobe later. Now he was hungry, so he went downstairs to get some food. He opened the fridge. What a disappointment! There were two boiled potatoes, some ham and a bottle of milk. It wasn't much, but Ian had no choice. He ate his meal in the lounge in front of the television. When he had finished, he took the dishes into the kitchen and threw them into the sink. He heard the plate break. When he returned to the lounge, 
his favourite quiz show was starting. He lay down on the sofa to watch television. After a while, his eyes felt heavy. He was tired. He turned off the television and went upstairs to bed. He had been asleep for about an hour when he was awoken by a loud noise. A window being smashed. He heard the glass fall to the floor. He sat up in bed and switched on the bedside lamp. He could hear voices from downstairs. Burglars! He sat still for a moment, wondering what to do. The telephone was downstairs, so he couldn't call for help. Should he go downstairs and face them? No, they may be dangerous. He heard them walking through the hallway and turning on a light switch. Ian got out of bed and crept onto the landing. He could hear the thieves talking. He listened to what they were saying. Where did you bury him? I think it's better if you don't know. Don't worry, nobody will ever find him. Oh, God, I didn't mean to do it. Ian trembled. The thieves had killed someone and buried the body. He looked down the stairs and saw the two men. One of them was sitting on the sofa. The other stood leaning against the table. Both were wearing black suits. The man near the table had a red stain on his white shirt. Blood? Ian walked as quietly as possible into the bedroom. He closed the door behind him. How could he escape? He thought of a film that he had once seen. A man had escaped from a burning house by using the bed sheets as a rope. Ian ran to the window. He looked down. It was a long drop. There was no grass beneath him, just concrete. Suddenly the voices were nearer. They were coming up the stairs. Ian shook with fear. He didn't know where to hide. He looked around the room desperately. The wardrobe! He ran to it, climbed inside, and pulled the door shut. The voices and footsteps approached. Someone opened the bedroom door. Ian stopped breathing. One of the men spoke. I told you, there's nobody here. Look for yourself. They closed the door and continued along the landing. Ian jumped out of the wardrobe and ran to the door. He opened it slowly. He checked that the landing was empty. The voices were coming from one of the larger bedrooms. They were looking for money. Ian ran quickly out of the room and down the stairs. He had to call the police. He picked up the telephone and dialed 999. The phone was dead. The murderers had cut the outside wires. How could he call for help? He looked down at his bare feet. His slippers were upstairs. So were his clothes. He couldn't go out into the cold night in his pyjamas. The light on the landing suddenly came on. He could hear someone coming down the stairs. Ian threw himself onto the floor behind the table. One of the men had gone into the kitchen. He heard him opening a cupboard and pouring out a glass of water. He had an idea. Now that the men had separated, maybe he could face them on his own. He moved as quietly as possible and hid behind the kitchen door. The man finished his drink and walked towards the hall. Ian was ready. Just as the man put his foot in the doorway, Ian pushed the door as hard as he could. The man shouted with pain and fell onto the floor. Ian quickly closed the door and turned the key. He knew that the man's cries would soon be heard by his accomplice, so he had to try and stop the other one. He didn't have time to think. 
The man was coming down the stairs. Ian crouched down behind a cupboard. It was dark, and he couldn't be seen. The man lost his balance and fell down the last few steps. Ian unplugged the telephone and ran quickly to where the man lay. He was face down and not fully conscious. Using the telephone wire, Ian tied the man's hands behind his back. Who are you? What do you want? The man cried. Ian didn't answer and ran up the stairs to his bedroom. He found his slippers and his dressing gown. Now he had to run and get help. He jumped over the man at the bottom of the stairs, ignoring his cries, and ran towards the front door. He threw it open and screamed with fright. There, before him, was the man that he'd locked in the kitchen. Blood was dripping from his nose. The man took hold of Ian's arms and put them behind his back. He was very strong. Ian couldn't escape. You little hooligan! You forgot about the back door in the kitchen, didn't you? He pushed Ian onto the sofa. Bill, untie me! The man that Ian had left at the bottom of the stairs stood up and walked towards them. The telephone hung from the wire behind his back. Who's this? he asked. I don't know, but I'm going to teach him a lesson. He put his hand to the inside pocket of his jacket. He was looking for his gun. Damn, I must have left it in the car, the man said. He went out of the front door. Ian shook with fear. He looked around him. He had no chance of escaping. The men were too big and too strong. Maybe he could convince them to let him go. Listen, he said. I've got some money upstairs in my case. You can have it if you let me go. I won't tell anyone. <laughs> what? The man laughed. You're joking. The other man came back in. He was holding a small black object. Ian closed his eyes. It was the end. No, no, he begged. Sorry, you deserve it, came the reply. Ian waited. His eyes still closed tightly. Hello, police. I've just found a thief in my house. Yes, he's here in front of me. Ian opened his eyes in amazement. The little black object was a telephone. Your house? he cried. They didn't answer him. The address? 28 Cliff View. Yes, he's under control. We'll wait. What do you mean, your house? This is my uncle's house. Try telling that to the police. Ian tried to convince them that he was telling the truth. They wouldn't listen. A few minutes later, a police car arrived. Ian was arrested. At the police station, he was questioned, but nobody would believe him. He was allowed to phone his uncle. Talk to them, Uncle Patrick. Tell them that the house is yours. His uncle's reply shocked him. I can't, Uncle Patrick replied. It isn't my house. Mine is number 26. Uncle Patrick spoke to the police and explained the situation. Ian had made a terrible mistake. What about the man they buried? I heard them talking about the murder, he said to the policeman. The two men looked at each other. What man? the policeman asked. That wasn't a man. It was a dog. We hit it with a car coming back from the restaurant. It didn't have a collar. It was a stray. What else could I do? And the blood on your shirt? That's not blood, the policeman replied. It's wine. I can smell it from here. Ian felt stupid. He had to stay in the station while the police and one of the men went to check that nothing had been stolen. When they returned, they had Ian's suitcase with them. It was almost eight o'clock in the morning. Ian was not charged and was free to go. He apologised to the two men and was accompanied to his uncle's house. This time, the right one. Ian was left in the doorway of 26 Cliff View.
He'd had a bad night, and he was tired. He found the door key under the mat. There was a letter under the door. He bent to pick it up. It was from Paula. It read, After three hours on the train, I expected to find you at home. Don't bother phoning. I don't want to speak to you. Ian had some explaining to do.